We had an amazing day yesterday. 28 of us from the chaplaincy went on pilgrimage round London to visit some of the religious houses and congregations of the city. So we took in the Carmelite sisters in Notting Hill, the sisters of the Assumption, some Jesuits, some sisters of Nazareth, and we ended up meeting the seminarians at Allen Hall in Chelsea. And I think we were all really struck by the joy of the people we met, their humanity, and a wonderful mix of ordinariness and a sense of purpose about their lives, a clarity about who they were and what they were doing. And it has to be said, a kind of holiness from their own witness and example. And this just gives a very nice connection with the reading today, the second reading. Because in chapter 7 of the first letter to the Corinthians, St Paul is writing about marriage and family life. And in the passage we've just heard, he's writing especially about those who choose to remain unmarried so that they can give their undivided attention to the Lord. So this is one of the very earliest writings of the New Testament. It's giving witness to one of the very earliest Christian communities at Corinth. And we see here the primitive form of what today we would call consecrated life. And there is a golden thread of consecrated life running through the Christian centuries from St. Paul's communities to the Egyptian desert fathers to the great medieval monasteries, to the missionary congregations of the Counter-Reformation, to those teaching and nursing orders of the 19th century, and to the consecrated men and women of our own time, many of them associated with the chaplaincy here. It struck me yesterday, chatting to the students, that actually consecrated life is a great mystery to many of you, even very committed Catholics, so I just thought it's worth explaining some of the very basics, and forgive me if you know all this already. Just to think about what are the different kinds of consecrated life? What do the religious orders have in common, in particular? And what does all this actually mean for them and for you and me? Well, first, the different kinds of religious life and consecrated life. Look. There are thousands and thousands of different religious and consecrated communities. If every seat in this chapel were filled by a member of a different congregation, you wouldn't even have every congregation in the City of London. Let me take the risk then of vastly simplifying, and you can come up and correct me afterwards, but I'm going to take the risk. Roughly, there are three types of consecrated life. There are, con there are contemplative, enclosed communities, separated from the world, whose focus is on prayer and their own community life together. And you can think of the Benedictines, the Cistercians, the Poor Clares, the Carmelite nuns, just some random examples. And they are usually called monks and nuns, rather than brothers and sisters, usually. Then there's the active apostolic orders. They're consecrated, but they're working and ministering in the world as missionaries, teachers, priests, nurses, social workers, etc., and just again, random examples, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, Father Jose behind me here, the Jesuits, Sisters of Mercy, Missionaries of Charity, Mother Teresa's congregation. Sister Mary, our own chaplain, is one of the poor servants of the Mother of God. And Sister Monica and Sister Susanna in our chaplaincy are Verbum Dei sisters. And these different people are usually called brothers and sisters rather than monks and nuns, just to distinguish. And last, third, there's a group that I'll just put under the umbrella, it's not exact, of secular. Now this doesn't mean atheist, that would be a bit odd, I suppose it's possible. No, a secular consecrated person, 
is someone who lives and works in the world. They're consecrated, but they're not primarily living in religious communities. They're not wearing habits. Sometimes they're not taking lifelong vows, but they're making different kinds of consecrated promises to live their consecration in the world. For example, secular institutes, consecrated virgins devoted to working in their diocese, and actually secular priests like myself and Father Joe. We are in this category because I haven't taken religious vows. I've taken the promises of a secular priest. So this is just a little sketch, a bit of geography, as it were. The second question, though, what do the religious orders have in common? The contemplatives and the apostolics, and I'll just leave aside the secular institutes for the moment. The catechism says that religious orders are defined by lifelong vows of poverty, chastity and obedience. And here, chastity, strictly speaking, it means consecrated celibacy. Because actually we're all called to chastity in our lives, but we're not all called to consecrated celibacy. These are the evangelical vows that take us to the heart of the gospel. Now you can look at them in negative terms, can't you? Poverty, chastity, obedience. I'm giving up personal property. I'm giving up marriage and family life. I'm giving up the freedom to do what I want. And there's some truth in this, some. But it's much more important to see the positive. The evangelical vows are meant to liberate the Christian, to give you a profound freedom to love God and to love your neighbour. To be, for example, free from possessions and, above all, possessiveness, acquisitiveness, consumerism, so that you can have a simplicity of heart in your relationship with the things of the world and with others. You're free from the concrete responsibilities of a single family life to be open and available to others and to all in forms of service and consecration, many of which would be impossible if you had a commitment to family itself, to your own family. And obedience, the vow of obedience, gives you a freedom to go beyond your own desires and plans and your limited visions and to share in the vision of Christ, of the whole church, to say yes to love in ways that are difficult if you depend only on your own self, your own plans and your own visions, you will be very limited. The vow of obedience is meant to free and liberate your vision and your service. These vows, this inner freedom that flows out into the life, it's what unites all forms of religious life, however different. The enclosed contemplative and the apostolic missionary all of them have that freedom to say yes to God, as St. Paul says in his letter, with undivided devotion, undivided attention. So the last big question, what does it all really mean for the religious, for the consecrated, and for you and me as we, we share this vision with them? Well, the common answer is this. And just see if this rings true to you. The common answer is to say that religious people, religious vows, religious people, brothers and sisters, monks and nuns, have given their lives to God completely, have consecrated their lives to him. And for many nuns, for example, this is symbolised by the way that their religious consecration will mirror and echo a marriage ceremony. So there's some truth to this. There is a gift of self, an unconditional yes in religious vows. 
And for me, at my priestly consecration, I remember lying prostrate in the centre of the church just before I was ordained, laying my life before the Lord, saying yes unconditionally. There is a gift of self. There is a new yes. But you see there's something not quite right about this explanation. Why? Because every Christian has given their lives completely to God. When you were baptised, you died with Christ. You rose with him and you're called to share his life, his death and his resurrection in your own life and with everyone that you meet. You, as a baptised Christian, have already said yes unconditionally. You, as a layperson, have promised to give your whole heart to God in faith, hope and charity. Putting it simply, you have promised to love God and to love your neighbour. There's nothing more that you can do for God. There's nothing more you can say than is contained within the Our Father, especially when you say, thy will be done. This is the call to holiness. It's the most fundamental, radical call. And religious brothers and sisters, monks and nuns, they do not have a greater call than you or me. Religious are not expert Christians, superheroes, the hit squad. All of us are called to heroic virtue, to hold nothing back. So how do we bridge this? Yes, they're consecrated, but on the other hand, we're all consecrated. Well, a friend of mine, Sister Bernadette, who taught the theology of vocation at Allen Hall Seminary, she said, the gift of the religious vows is that it gives an intensification of the baptismal promises. An intensification of the baptismal promises. So religious people, religious brothers and sisters, they don't love God or their neighbour more than you or me, more than a layperson, but they love in a way that is more conscious, more explicit, more part of the very professed structure of their lives and their religious vows. The love that we are all trying to live, you can see more clearly in the religious vows and their lives, because it's put at the centre. So mothers, fathers, teachers, bankers, journalists, psychotherapists, street cleaners, all of us are loving God and our neighbour, often at great cost. The religious make that same love of God and neighbour more explicit. And that's why often there is such a beauty and a purity and a transparency about their lives. They help us see what is truly important in our own secular lives. They don't undermine what lay people are doing, as if work and family life were unimportant, but they help all of us, secular priests, lay people, to see the deepest meaning of our own lives in the world. They help us to see what our love really means. And actually, they help us to see which part of our loving lives will endure. Because love is the only thing that will last for all eternity. So religious vows put the focus for them and us on what is truly valuable, on God's kingdom. What a great gift to the church and to all of us they are. Yesterday, when we were in the Carmelite monastery, one of the students asked a Carmelite sister, how did you discover your vocation? And she said, it wasn't a clever plan. It wasn't an ideal. It wasn't because I was swept up with the idea of religious life. It was a call. God called me to be a religious sister. It came unexpectedly. And when I began to listen, I had to say yes. A religious vocation is not an ideal. 
It is a calling. Another friend of mine who is consecrated in a secular institute was telling me that when she was a teenager she had absolutely no thought of consecrated life. But once she went to church to a service and the preacher said to, to all the congregation God is calling many of you. And when she heard him say that something touched her heart and it was the beginning of her vocation. I hope and pray that many of you are called to religious and consecrated life. As I said last week the most important thing for you as young people as students is simply that you are open to your vocation. Some of you today may feel that God is calling you and I would say to each of you in the name of the church almost looking at each one of you personally individually perhaps God is calling you to a religious or consecrated vocation. Perhaps you've never thought of it before, really. Perhaps today something is wanting to echo in your heart from the Lord and call you to this. Maybe you won't understand what it means today. Maybe, probably, you won't be able to say yes today. But I pray that for some of you, perhaps many, Today is a seed and a beginning.